Welcome to our viewers. I'm Carolyn Jardina, and thank you for joining us for this special episode of The Hollywood Reporters Behind the Screen. So how is the Hollywood creative community navigating the impact of the corona crisis, and how do we get back to work? That's what we'll be talking about today with a panel of our talented creative professionals. I'm going to introduce our panelists now. Please join me in welcoming Kabir Aftar, director of Crazy Ex-Girlfriend and Never Have I Ever. Hi, Kabir. Hello. Hi. Uh, John Axelrad, editor. Uh, his credits include James Gray's Ad Astra and Lost City of Z. Welcome, John. Thank you very much for having me. Steve Fanagan, sound editor, designer, and mixer. Uh, he's a Game of Thrones alum who uh, actually is just wrapping up BBC's Normal People. Welcome. Thank you for having me. Kirsten Coleman, makeup artist. Um, her, credit, her, her credits include Euphoria and Barry Jenkins' upcoming series, The Underground Railroad. Thank you so much for joining us. Hi, thanks for having me. Appreciate it. And costume designer, Melissa Bruning, whose credits include Dawn of the Planet of the Apes and War for the Planet of the Apes. Thank you for joining us too. Hello, hi everybody. So for starters, how is everybody? I'm at home. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, Kabir, yeah. we're gonna start with you. How are you, how are you filling your days? <laughs> You're looking at it, you know. <laughs> I'm looking for different backgrounds for Zoom calls like this. Uh, today we're in the living room. That's fun. Uh, it's, you know, it's weird, right? I mean, as a freelancer, I think we're all used to hitting a hiatus every now and then and like taking a break from projects. But we're also all used to filling that time with either looking for the next gig or just life stuff and hanging out. And now here we are. Well, what are you planning right now or uh, are, are you uh, working on new ideas? What kind of uh, conversations are you having with your colleagues right now? You know, I think mostly these conversations have been about like when we can get back to work, you know, in a safe way that like everything is open again. And I mean, it just seems like it's going to be a while still. Um, so just there's still you know, lots of optimistic conversations about next season. But like, when is next season? You know, I mean, normally, what are we? <laughs> we're May right now. We should just about to start talking about the fall shows, right? But are there fall shows? I mean, pilot season hasn't happened yet. So that's confusing. Are you talking to colleagues about ways of doing some of these shows remotely? No, I'm not yet. I mean, not yet. I mean, I think that, I don't know. I mean, you know, just thinking about being on set with like 100 people and what that's going to be like. And when can we do that? I mean, I think. A lot of friends who work in post are all running, you know, they're running out of footage. <laughs> like that work yeah. is all kind of ending. So, you know, the pipeline is kind of stalled for everybody. John, you were working at home. Uh, would you tell us about your experience? Me? <clears throat> well, actually, um, I wasn't working at home. Um, I was on a show. I finished a feature film called Antebellum just in the nick of time at the end of February. And then there's a show down the hall for me uh, at the editing facility that hired me to come on as the second editor. And I was on for three weeks before we uh, got shut down due to the virus. Um, now, a lot of my colleagues in post-production, we do have the, I guess, the privilege of being able to work from home ostensibly, but um, not everyone is doing it. And in my case, I came on as a second editor and it was a crew of 15 people working hand in hand. We had visual effects and sound and music, uh, everyone in, in our suite. Um, and what they decided to do was just have a skeleton crew of the main editor and the director uh, still working on the director's cut. It was actually a trilogy of films, so they were still working on director's cut as the third film. So I was furloughed like everyone else, um, still waiting to hear if we're going to go back or if we will set up uh, at home systems so we can work from home. Um, again, we do have that ability to do so. It's not an ideal way to work since we're in a very collaborative medium, but um, you know, that, that is an advantage of people in post-production. We can do this. 
For the uninitiated, would you describe how the editing process is set up and works from home and how you collaborate with the director and your colleagues? Well, <clears throat> you know, I've talked to a few of my colleagues who are still doing this. Um, sometimes you can tap into the system uh, at work. You know, the studios are very concerned about security. And so they don't, I, I think some rules are being bent now. So we do have a lot of people taking media home with them on hard drives um, and being able to work with secure footage. They probably have to sign all these NDAs. Um, but then there's some other systems, uh, Evercast and some other platforms where you can actually tap into remote servers and uh, literally be working at the work site on the secure servers, but you're basically tapping into them from your home setup. Um, usually you need more than just a laptop and your own software. So sometimes post-production vendors will actually set you up with equipment and either through platforms like Evercast or even in simple platforms like Zoom. I know people have been sharing edits on Zoom um, with directors and producers. Um, and there are some few that um, have taken the COVID-19 test and director and editor working together at the director's house. So I don't know how safe that is, but I, I assume if, if they have passed the health measures, they figure that uh, they're safe to do so. Well, you and Kabir both are editors. I mean, what are your thoughts on, um, you know, moving forward if this process continues? Um, is, is working at home from Zoom the same sort of, you know, collaborative experience that you get when, you know, your director is sitting in your edit room? And, you know, are there pros and cons to this sort of setup? Yeah, I mean, that's, no, I mean, that just seems like, you know, the whole fun part about working together with someone. I did a show uh, last year that I shot in Vancouver and they posted in Vancouver, but I was back here. Um, and we had one of these kind of, you know, setups, basically FaceTime. Like I had my phone set up right next to my laptop. So we were just FaceTiming with the editor um, and I had a live stream output from the Avid that was, you know, I forgot the name of the program they were using, but it worked really well. Um, to be able to communicate, we were just, but we were just sat there, the two of us together all day, <laughs> worked on it, um, which seemed okay. But I mean, having daily streaming remotely or anything, that seems like, you know, timing wise, like, if I, well, if they, they say necessity is the mother of invention. And I think at this particular time, it's great that we have options like that. I think, you know, it, it is definitely convenient um, and we're blessed to be able to be in this day and age where we have this. I mean, had this pandemic happened 15 years ago, I think we would have been in a lot more trouble. Um, I don't feel that working from home will be the new normal, per se, for post-production and maybe this way for a while. But my personal opinion is every director I've worked with craves that in-person collaboration. And especially on bigger films, when you have crews of 10, 15 people working down the hall from one another, nothing can replace that 12 hour a day productivity um, of being able to just call people as, as you need them and say, hey, you know, can you help me with this? I need this. And um, I don't know how many marathon online sessions you can do with virtual editing, but I think things will probably go back to normal. I mean, we'll obviously have social distancing guidelines for forever after this experience. But um, but we are blessed to at least be able to, to do this, as you say, uh, you know, in a pinch. Yeah, I agree. Yes. I think that if you think about like collaborating and not just in post, but anywhere with any two people, uh, for all of us, I mean, Zoom rhythm is different than like normal conversation rhythm, right? Like even Zoom happy hours is like, cool, it's nice seeing friends, but it's like there's six of us and one of us is talking at a time. Like that's not normal for hanging out with my friends. Like, you know, or for being at work where people are all just like pitching and contributing like spontaneous ideas. Um, yeah, I don't know. I don't know, man. <laughs> Let, let's bring Steve into this part of the conversation. Steve, um, there's mixing, there's ADR recording, there's music recording. Would you talk about the different aspects of your job and you know what you're finding you can and cannot do at this point? 
it's still like it, it, it's the same as what the guys are saying you know we're we're having to be creative and figure out ways to work around this and they may not be the ideal which is obviously people in the same room or in the same space as each other working collaboratively collaboratively but i think we're at a point where so on normal people as we were finishing the series we went into lockdown and i've been working remotely in london on that show uh, for the most of the schedule and going back and forth to dublin for mixes but it became apparent as we were nearing the end and had two episodes left to complete that that just wasn't going to be possible ireland went on shutdown before the uk and the uk followed a couple of weeks later so we just started to look at ways that we could work that would allow us to finish the series properly and i think had we not been sort of 10 episodes into a 12 episode run it might have been a trickier thing to figure out but ultimately we ended up having i had to mix the show uh, on my own and we had to upload screeners for everyone to watch and review and we had to build time into our schedule to allow for how the feedback on that would happen and how the notes would be done. We, we you know, there is no way for us to sort of mix remotely that would be instantaneous and, and useful in a streaming sort of way. So it made sense to sort of finish a mix, upload the mix, review the mix, have a conversation like this. We used, we used software like BlueJeans, uh, which works exactly the same way as this, had a good conversation. I went away and did notes. Nal went off and did any fixed notes he might have needed to do. We pulled everything back together and we uploaded again. And I was encouraging everyone to listen, say on their home TV. We were mixing a TV show, which was useful. I think this would have been harder with a feature film. Um, but it allowed us to, so they could watch in their home on their TV, which is probably you know, an optimum viewing experience for them because it's what they're used to watching and hearing. So at least they can react to the soundtrack based on what they're used to uh, in their home space. I also asked them all to maybe have a second viewing with headphones that they were used to and watch on a tablet or uh, whatever their remote way of viewing might be because we were conscious that this show would be watched by people on iPads and phones and whatever else it might be, uh, you know, when someone's downloading a streamable show from Hulu or BBC. So we, we figured out a way to work around it, but it, you know, it, it wouldn't have been straightforward had I not had that support from my director and Element Productions, the production company, who were willing to allow us um, just a little bit more time and a little bit more uh, trust than maybe you would uh, feel you were in a position to ask for if you were working with someone for the first time. So, you know, it, it's, it's been an interesting learning curve. And in the weeks since that, we finished. Um, so we, when lockdown happened, we had a few days of a run into it. So the actors we needed to finish ADR with, we were able to finish ADR with. So studios here were still open. So we were able to get people in. Social distancing was maintained, even though it hadn't become policy here yet. And Niall and Lenny were in a studio in Dublin listening in via Source Connect, and they socially distanced from each other in that listening environment. And uh, and and from there on, we were able to do so. That that actually has already happened on St Patrick's Day. So we worked the bank holiday, a traditional Irish bank holiday, to make sure that we could get it done. Our post supervisor Tricia Parrott and uh, our ADR wrangler Jamie. Paisley, they worked really hard to pull everyone together as quickly as possible um, so that we were able to actually record the way we would generally do it, um, albeit with some social distancing involved. But had it been a week later, we would have had to have gotten quite a bit more creative. And I think there are some very interesting creative ways that people are figuring out to record AUR. Um, Todd AO have an app that uh, is quite remarkable. It's called um, Actor AD or Actors Mobile AD or, and it's a way to basically uh, submit clips to an actor. The software provides streamers and text, and the actor can then take an iPad with hopefully some sort of semi professional microphone connected to it and record the loops at home. Obviously, it creates, it's not the ideal scenario, but it is a scenario that is being, people are finding effective. Uh, we had to do a little bit of swear cover for an airline version of the show and we were able to connect with an actor that way and it worked just fine. And I think obviously the limitation with that is you can't be in the room with them, you can't set up the mic for them, 
you know, someone's recording in their living room, it's a reflective space. So, you know, to try and sort of have a little bit of a session with them beforehand where you test the microphone and where you suggest, you know, have you got two or three places we can check out in your home where you could potentially record this AD or and we could figure out which one might suit best. So it's 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 not an ideal uh, fix, but it is a fix. And people are going to much greater lengths now. Um, if anyone's interested, there's a brilliant um, amps who are the Sound Guild here in the UK have a brilliant podcast that they did with several dialogue and ADR supervisors. And they're all just discussing the various workarounds they're using at the moment. So some studios are using social distancing. So the only people present at the ADR session are the ADR mixer and the actor. And they're social distancing when they meet. And then they're in separate studios while they record. So they're connected remotely, but they're not in the same room. And obviously, uh, directors can dial into that maybe via Skype or if they have something more sophisticated, maybe they can source connect in. But I think it, it's one of those situations where I think the, the type of people who work in this industry tend to get creative. And so people are finding interesting ways to figure out how to finish shows. And I think at the moment, a lot of the work is about the stuff that actually managed to film and has been in post for a period of time, figuring out how to finish it effectively. Um, and, and, and then obviously the, the, the bigger question is how we're going to get back to production. Right, right. So we're going to move on to Kirsten. Um, obviously production is not on, but you've mentioned that you've been doing tutorials and things like that on social media. Would you talk a bit about what you've been up to? Yeah. Um, you know, Obviously, my job is literally being within that six foot radius <laughs> of people. So, you know, it's so it's so interesting to me to hear everyone else, you know, the people that can work from home. I'm always like, what's that like? Because my job is literally based off of touching people's faces and their physical bodies. So it's it's um it's been interesting for me, but I have used social media um and and teaching classes and there's all kinds of things I've been doing now because everyone's at home and I get the biggest question all the time what's like how do I do my makeup for zoom meetings and all this stuff so it's been interesting because I've been able to um, tap into you know doing film and, and and doing creative narrative work is is my favorite but I've also been able to sway over to um, kind of you know my followers with euphoria and social media and just kind of creating a space of like helping people be creative with their own self-expression and also you're bored at home and you want to do stuff so I've I've kept myself pretty busy with um just educating people on how to like be fun and, and creative on their own time with their own makeup uh which has been it's been good and it's you know it's kept me it's kept me fresh and and you know originally so I was working on the show for Barry Jenkins Underground Railroad in Georgia and I, I left a little bit early to come back and start season two of Euphoria and that was March 10th or something like that and it was like that week was when everything just rapidly every day it got like right. more more wild you know warnings and, and and everything so you know it was they were basically like hey we're shutting down and and so we in a way it was it was stressful going just back to back from show to show you know series to series um so it's been nice to have this time to actually really prepare and and really be creative and just have like a no pressure state of being able to really just like let the the ideas flow and just kind of have like a um i don't know i guess stress-free environment to be really create and prepare for the show so that's been kind of the silver lining of the whole thing of course it's uh it's been stressful not having work and, and we don't go back to work till september so <laughs> that's when they said we're gonna start filming right. so i have that, that much time to, to fill my my time so um i don't know you know I, I at first it was really stressful and 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 i think it was hard for our personalities to adjust with like going from full-on work mode to just dead silence and i think everyone kind of felt that a little bit um but now i'm sort of just i'm just trying to take it as i can and accept the gift of having the free time right now and and uh and use it wisely and and trying to stay creative so that's how I've been using my time. Well, what you brought up is something I think every, we're all, you know, adjusting to that. Um, what is everyone doing to, you know, to stay, you know, 
sane and creative during this time? Has anyone picked up new hobbies or what, what is everyone doing? I watch my kids. <laughs> I, have, I have two small children. I have a almost three-year-old and a just six-year-old. And um, so my day is full. Is um, that a new hobby? <laughs> no, that is the hobby I've had for six years. <laughs> the hobby was I used to see other people and have coffee and, and right. go to the bathroom by myself. <laughs> Thank God for them. I mean, I love my family. I, it's amazing that at these, this age that we do get to interact so much and it's not just dropping them off at soccer or picking up at school or preschool or, you know, cramming in work questions in the evening in between making dinner and getting bath time. And so it's been a nice full routine. Um, but it's definitely as, as an adult, anytime anybody who's an adult is around, I'm like, oh my God, a conversation. <laughs> um, <laughs> besides my partner, who's an actor. So we're both sort of used to spending a lot of time together when we're not working, which is good. Um, but yeah, it's, it's been the unendingness of it is, I feel uh -huh. like the most stressful part of it. Melissa, there's one initiative you've been up to, though, that I would love you to talk about. The Costume Designers Guild has um, an initiative in place where they've been sewing masks. As I understand, uh, they've made and as a as a guild, you've made and delivered uh, more than twenty thousand at this stage. Um, and I know you've been involved in that. Would you describe it? Yeah, um, I have always supported myself on sewing. I learned how to sew when I was eight. My aunts all sewed and as a costume designer going up the ranks, I knew I could make anything look amazing because I could tailor it in the truck if I had to. Um, and so in these times, you know, I saw on, I think it was a Rachel Maddow that they were looking for people to make cloth masks, like just, just regular masks, even to go over the N95 masks. And so I started looking into that and gathering stuff in my house. And then the guild sent out a notice saying that they were working with, it was 892 and 705, were working together to create a program where they would gather supplies, put together a packet for you. You could go and pick it up, create the masks, and then drop off in a safe environment. And so I think I started that, let's see, we got shut in around the 13th and then I think I picked up masks that Tuesday and then I've made a little over a hundred masks and then also masks for some of my family and this is sort of I mean they're not they're not fancy you hook over your ears but they've got metal we put twisty ties at the top so they bend to your nose and they're machine washable and they stretch and um, I feel like I'm helping Great. Fantastic. Pretty cool. Really fantastic. And I don't have any idea how to use a sewing machine. So. <laughs> <laughs> my husband cuts out things for me. If, if, if I get stuck and I know I have some due and you know, the drop offs now are on Tuesdays and Thursdays. So I don't want to like miss a window of picking up and dropping off. And so I, he's gotten used to my rotary cutter so he can cut out. <laughs> Put him to work. <laughs> and the kids pick up the pins. <laughs> that's that's fun. <laughs> yeah, it's a good yeah. project for them. Yeah. You ask them what color is the pin top, you know, and then it's like school. So. <laughs> <laughs> right. <laughs> Yeah. Going the real thing these days. <laughs> now, Kirsten, I'm sure a lot of people have been asking you about how to do hair and makeup for all the Zoom meetings we've been having. Uh, would you like to share some tips? <laughs> um, yeah, I think, well, this is something I, I always recommend to people, but I feel like more than ever, um, there's no excuse for this not to happen. And that's getting a lot of sleep. <laughs> I'm telling you right now, that's literally the best you can ever look is just making sure you're rested and making sure you're drinking a lot of water. Um, that's the best makeup. And I, I, I'm just a, a firm advocate in skincare and just taking care of yourself more than anything. But if you're in a pinch um, and you have like five minutes to do your makeup, mascara, concealer, and like a blush, if you can do your brows, great, but just a quick, 
your mascara will always open up your eyes, right? If you don't wear mascara, sometimes it just looks like you're like this. Like it just, it just opens up your eyes right away. So that's always my go-to if I'm like, you know, life or death situation. I only have five minutes <laughs> to do my makeup. <laughs> um, but yeah, skincare and taking care of yourself. Everyone should be sleeping right now. I'm sorry. There's no excuse. <laughs> you know, um, I'm sure in the beginning when things are stressful, you know, as we were processing what was going on, maybe there wasn't as much sleep, but um, I mean, I'm thankful I can get eight hours. I mean, who gets eight hours in our line of work ever? I mean, I never do. If I get six hours, I'm thankful. So I've been utilizing my bed quite often for that. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah. I, find, I find that don't watch the news before you go to bed I get better sleep <laughs> yeah. 10 minutes of the news max every day is all I can handle I just that's all I need <laughs> don't abuse it <laughs> yeah I'm sleeping the correct amount I'm just sleeping all the wrong hours and it's sort of different every day um, yes <laughs> it's kind of it's funny because it's sort of it's the same sort of jet lag you get just being on set where suddenly like on Friday, I'm like waking up much later than I would be on Monday for no, you know, for nor at work, I would have a reason to have an 11 o'clock call. But now I, I don't know. I'm just sort of staying up late, catching up on TV shows that I've been meaning to watch. You know, I watched season one of The Wire last week and season two of The Wire this week. So <laughs> finally making my way through it, really enjoying it. Great show. Thanks, no spoilers. <laughs> Still gone. <laughs> <laughs> Such a good show. And are, are all of you in touch with, uh, are, are you doing um, meetings with your union or the, your agents or, you know, what, what kind of, you know, business, how are you getting your business information right now? We get a weekly update from, at least from my agency, from APA, they send out a weekly update of, you know, what, what they're talking about with studios, um, what the plans are, um, how are you, we're still here for you. Um, you know, it's, it's more moral support. Um, I think that, you know, a lot of us know like um, hair, makeup, wardrobe, like all of us that just do actors. Um, I don't, I, I imagine a lot, a lot of plexiglass in the future. I, I don't. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I, I had a dream the other night of just actors. Like there was a plexi around the set, and you could like pass them things, like boy in a bubble, <laughs> you know. But I don't. I could prep. I certainly could prep a job. Not really seeing many people. But once I got into physically looking at fabrics or picking, how do you go shopping? Do you just keep. Bloomingdale's open for a couple hours for shoppers. I mean, I just don't know how it all works. And I don't it's, think they do either. No, I, th I think it's interesting. You think about, there was so many questions. I was midway through shooting an episode for Universal and we had, in addition to having scenes with, you know, a hundred background or whatever. So good luck with that yeah. um, <laughs> whenever we get back to normal. But we also had like a, you know, location day at like someone's house, you know, at like a house in the Valley. So are they gonna want? All of us strangers tromping through their house? I don't think so, you know? I mean, just the get back to work of it all is like, just from speaking to like my agent, my manager, and like just, you know, other people and friends and whatnot, everyone, there's a lot of like sort of optimism about when we get back and when we get to start and like, you know, they're still sending me like scripts to read about like things that might come along down the pike and like, you know, Halloween or Christmas or whenever. <laughs> But so certainly we'll all be working again someday. Well, Kabir, could you elaborate a little bit on what are, what are some of the pain points and areas that you're thinking about in your job that you're gonna to have to address as we begin to uh, open up things up? I mean, I, I start really simple and small. I mean, I, I think there's, there's, in addition to like the obvious, how do we get a hundred people together in a fluid dynamic space where everyone's moving back and forth and interfacing with everybody else. I mean, certainly Kirsten, you you big right up in people's faces, like, you know, <laughs> yeah. inches away from people um, yeah. is part of the job. And, and, but I start in an even simpler way. Like I'm thinking about getting onto the lot in the morning. Like there are security people at the gate who have to interface with hundreds of people in the morning. What's that like for them? Like people, you know, if you've got to drive on, you have to hold your license up to the window. I mean, there's so many small details about like the work day and like how early you get there before your call time, knowing you have to park and walk to wherever you're walking to. But also now get into the lot will be a long line of cars. Do you know what I mean? I mean, like 
there's so many of these details to consider. What's well, the Kirsten, you talked a little bit to me earlier about schedules because you, you mentioned that your job is going to take longer, uh, you know, just between, you know, washing brushes and between yeah. applications and things like that. Would you elaborate? Hair and makeup in general, like, I have some relief because we are so trained already in sanitation and being clean. It's just, we have to, that I feel like um, I have faith. I mean, my union is also uh, working on a protocol right now for us to have moving forward. Um, but I think the trickiness, the tricky nature of it, right, is that to be really clean and sanitized between each actor, uh, we need more time. And, you know, like, for example, with Euphoria, I mean, the makeup looks we do on Euphoria already can take up to an hour and a half. And then you add on, you know, switching setup time, cleaning the station, you know, really there's extra cleanup time at the end of the day, like cleaning everyone's actor bags and really being clean, totally cleaning the trailer. I mean, I, that's what I'm, I'm sort of um, anticipating all these crazy extra cleaning measures, like just to really double, triple check to make sure we're clean in the, in the trailer because we're kind of the, 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 the entry point and the exit point of every actor at the end of the day. So um, we really have to be on top of it. And so I yeah. expect it taking, yes, a lot more time I think the tricky nature of it is, of course, you know, our job is always sort of um, <laughs> rushed by production, right? It's like, you're taking too long, we need five minutes, we need whatever. So we need the support, in my opinion, from production to give us the space we need to be as clean and sanitary as, as we absolutely need to be. Um, so I, I, I hope, you know, I, I predict a shift in how production kind of, um, moves through the day and you know and also you were talking about you know having 100 people on set another thing we do in euphoria is we have these major major scenes of like hundreds and hundreds of background and i'm just wondering you know for my makeup artists our background makeup artists you know like how do we keep them safe when you have 10 or 15 minutes per actor to pump them through the works and and we can't clean in between so that's you know, I mean, we can, but it's like, we really need the extra time right now. So I'm just hoping that production can, uh, you know, participate with us and, and listen to what we know as experts on how to stay clean. Um, but I also foresee a lot more tiling <laughs> when it comes to um, background scenes, uh -huh. because I don't think people are going to want 200, 300 background actors on set. Right. You know? And not to be weird, not Here, to be weird about this, up. but like, yeah. it's not just 200 background, but it's also 200 people you don't know. Right, like in a yeah. world where it's like we are all work together, you know. There's a strange new element, yeah. In there. Like a little bit of trust. And you know, they're going to come sick because they right. don't want to not show up, you know. So, yeah. but even even to tile actors, I mean, that's an act of dressing, staging, fitting, Absolutely. tiling. Visual effects has to do each one, and I did a lot of that. Uh, I just finished Space Jam two last year, and. I mean, we had 350 background every day for like four weeks, but then we also yeah. additionally were tiling <laughs> each of those people to magnify the crowds. It just can't be done right now. Right. Yeah. I mean, if you want to have a group of 20 background that work in an office or are your, your core background and you want to quarantine them and test them every day and do all their fittings at once and know everything you're going to do, with them, then you could probably have that many. But short of that, we're going to be doing small stories. Yep. Even, even small films, I think, are going to have, um, I think visual effects companies are really going to benefit from the new normal. Um, even small films, I'm hearing that they may have actors shoot scenes separately and then we push them together. Uh, even if it's just Two actors talking together in the drawing. So, uh, I think that it's I mean, funny because it you know, all these things are going to take so much longer that you know whatever everyone's first mm -hmm. day back at work is. There's, I think we're all prepared for the massive surprise we're all going to have on day one for how much longer everything suddenly takes. Yeah. Well, it's also going to be a priority because, mm -hmm. like, my husband had knee surgery last week, so he was able to get a COVID test. The nurses, anybody that needed to work on him got a COVID test. I couldn't go into the hospital. I had to drop him off at valet. And then they wheel him back out to me with me in a mask 
and put them in the car. And I just think that, you know, because testing is such a minimum until it becomes a maximum, then you're just going to have to, you know, who gets tested first? Actors. You know, who gets text tested next? Possibly makeup artists and hair people for their yeah. sake. You know, I think it goes in proximity to the actors because that's the priority of what you have to do to move forward, to actually get some content because people are burning through content. Sorry, post. So, and visual effects (laughs) take a long time. I mean, any film that I've worked on that's visual effects, it takes two to three years to come out. So, and you know, you can rush it so much, but a lot of the people I know in Space Jam 2 are working out of their houses. They had to take their computers, set up remotely, and it just takes even longer. Oh yeah. Especially when you think about like the, the pipeline that we're, you know, the full-time mm-hmm. pipeline of content coming has been shut off now. So, you know, I did a show yeah. for <laughs> Netflix, I did a show for Netflix last year, and I think it was supposed to come out in midsummer, and I've heard now they're gonna push it a couple months. I presume this is because there's an awareness that they, people are going to start running out of new things to watch. Exactly. There's going to be a lull in content that comes out at some point because there's literally just been a, you know, a shutdown of everything being produced right now. But like I said, it's given me a chance to go back and watch The Wire, which I'm very exactly. excited about. <laughs> No spoilers. I also worry that you know in Sweden that uh, Netflix is using a crew, but the the crew has agreed to quarantine for before the shoot and for during the shoot, and that's great for some people, but that's not going to be everybody's lives are not going to be able to work that way. So that's that's the other part of it to think about. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, and I, I think it's a really interesting one because you, even if you quarantine a crew, there's still going to be people that they're going to need to interact with at a hotel or wherever it might be. And if one tiny thing goes wrong in that scenario, you could have a whole production shut down because a few people get sick. And it, that's a, it, it's, you can sort of see how a closed system like that could have an application, but it sort of feels a little bit like you know, how, how restricted would that be? And what would the social distancing look like amongst crew members or amongst catering or whatever the ancillary people around that production would be? It feels, it feels like something that sounds good on paper, but in practice becomes very difficult. And it sort of feels to me like smaller things maybe are the way that production will start back up. And you can sort of imagine something that has very limited locations and has a very small cast. But even at that, I think as soon as they get into it, like you're saying, day one, it's going to be like, oh my God, this actually, what we thought would take us three hours is actually taking six. And, you know, I've heard stories like, you know, each department would get their time on the floor, but no one else would be on the floor. So you suddenly, you, you, you basically just, you know, you, in terms of actual people hours on set, it, it's just going to exponentially increase before you get to hit to actually record anything or to actually shoot anything. So it feels like, I think what's interesting is that there seems to be a good movement in the unions, both here and in the States, where each each department is sort of looking at what the safety protocol would need to be for that department. And if they can figure that out for each department, then at least those depart, all of those sort of ideas can be put together and see, well, how does this actually look for an entire production? And when you get a sense of how the small parts then move in relation to each other as, in, as well as in relation to themselves, maybe then you're moving towards something where you can actually start making a plan that's, that's possible. Um, but it's so hard to imagine how it works once there's any sort of outside communication or contact needed, whether that's extras or that's catering or that's, I don't know, as someone who has to get a lift somewhere rather than getting in their own car, you know, it becomes a, it becomes a dangerous thing, essentially. John, on the post side, you had actually mentioned something to me earlier that I hadn't thought of, um, just about uh, air conditioning um, for, you know, when you're working with computers. Could you talk about that? Yeah, sure. I, I mean, obviously, the biggest issue uh, to deal with when we get back to working is what happens on a film set when you've got hundreds of people interacting and the social distancing and sanitation. But um, we have to also 
think about things we take for granted. And for those that work in an air conditioned environment, um, in small quarters, and I'm talking about uh, production coordinators and supervisors, production accountants, and then those in post production. Um, I was in my late night news watching, which keeps me up at night. Um, saw a story about um, a restaurant in Wuhan, China, that uh, many patrons over the course of several months came down with COVID-19. And these people happened to sit at the same table, different people over different nights. And they determined that they were in the direct line of the air conditioning ducts. The virus now gets caught up in the system, and if you don't have proper ventilation um, or you don't have the proper filtration in place, the virus can live and thrive and spread. And so, you know, we might be in a facility where someone three doors down. I mean, we could all be in our own room wearing masks, but maybe some person three doors down, is not wearing a mask, cough, it goes into the air conditioning system and comes out in your room. I don't know the, the ins and outs of this. I'm not, you know, uh, privy to, to know how AC systems work. But I do think when we go back to work, and I know my guild, uh, the Editor's Guild and Kathy Rapola has taken a great leadership role on helping um, educate and uh, be proactive about safety steps that need to take place. I don't know if this is being addressed about air conditioning, but um, you know, we, we do need to, to look at that in, in addition to, when, when I go into a workspace, I, living in LA, I, I look at all earthquake dangers. You know, it's the first thing I do is like, okay, I don't want the bookshelf there, they could fall on me, I don't want this here because it could block my escape route. So I think when we go back, we have to take everything that we normally take for granted and really think it through. And um, I think uh, through strong leadership by our guilds, and I know IOTC or IA is, is uh, having an initiative to uh, really make the employer look out for protections for the employee, as opposed to the current administration, which and the Department of Labor, which is, I think they're saying that it's up to the employee to to protect themselves. Um, so there's got to be, uh, when we go back to work, the employer to make sure we have a safe working environment. So could we go around and could I ask each of you what you're hearing as far as when you think your projects or you're hearing other projects are going to start to inch toward uh, resuming or starting? I keep hearing the words August and September. Like, those are the two words that I hear. But who knows? Does that feel yeah. realistic to you? You know, I'll tell you, when we shut down in mid-March, you know, we were told it would be two weeks. And I think we all knew. We're like, they're just telling us it's two weeks. It's not going to be two weeks. Um, <clears throat> by the time, I think we were all like, well, maybe by June. But as we started to see, like, how this whole thing is unfolded, it's like, well, obviously, that's not realistic. Especially now it's May, forget it. So, you know, uh, look, August is another, what, 13 or so weeks from now? So, and this has been, it's been about seven weeks already. So, you know, I don't know. I mean, uh, right now things don't seem super different than they did when it started in terms of like it trending better. It's good that the city of LA is offering tests. I know someone who went and got a test yesterday. They waited in that line on Sepulveda of cars for an hour to get tested. Um, so it's good that that's happening, but you know, there's so many mechanisms that need to get lined up on what we've all been talking about. Like, bro, <laughs> there's a lot that yeah. has to get figured out. You know, we all want to go back to work. We all don't want to get sick. We all don't want to get someone else sick. Um, and we all don't want the work to suffer because we have to cut corners in order to get through it. So. I think yeah, I mean, I, I, there you go. Yeah. <laughs> go ahead. I'm just going to say, I, I think so much depends on, um, you know, on these predicted waves, as they say. Like, are we going to have a second wave? Are we going to have a bunch of ripples? Um, I, I mean, I'm also hearing August, September. I know that 
theaters are hoping to open by mid to late July. Um, I think parts of the country will get back to normal <laughs> sooner, but how long they're going to stay open is a big question because if we do get a second wave, things will shut down again. Um, you know, realistically, until we have a viable vaccine, uh, and even with a vaccine, things won't be normal, but I, I just don't know how we can, in earnest, get back to shooting and doing things that we normally have been doing, um, not knowing if this virus is going to come back stronger in the fall. I mean, the longer we wait, the better is is just how it needs to be. And I, I think people are really impatient right now, and I totally understand. And I think, especially right now, there's a level of comfortability that's happening where, where like, it's easier to go get food in the stores. It's easy. Things are, people are calming down a little bit. And I think it's easy in that level of being calm to be like, oh, wait, we can go back to work now, right? Or we can have some level of normalcy. And this is the moment, and if you look in the history of every single pandemic or anything, there's always this moment of, um, yeah, it's okay, let's go back to work. And then once again, another spike of infections happen and deaths and all this stuff. So I think we're in this uncomfortable time where we really want to go back to some sort of normalcy. But I mean, I still, I know for my production, we're you know, we're supposed to prep in late August and then start in September. And I still think that's subject to change. And I know, cause it's an HBO production and A24 and they're super serious about it. I mean, they, they absolutely will push it more if, if we need to. Um, so I take everything with the biggest like boulder of salt right now with that kind of stuff. <laughs> Sounds huge. <laughs> <laughs> it's big. Yeah, no, it's bits. yeah. <laughs> I mean, I'm hearing prepping, like starting to prep something. Um, and that would be late, late July to possibly film late fall, early winter. So depending on the size of the project, you know, those that have a lot of prep built into it are probably might put their toe in the water and know that they would have to hiatus, but might at least like get the the ball rolling so that you know if things happen i think until testing is something we do we can't even think about it um i think i'm grateful to be in california because it feels like we're actually getting stuff figured out our governor is being very safe um there are testing you could go get a test right now if you really wanted to um and i think that that's if if we're at that level where we can let the general public have tests then you know the studios and whatnot are like what do we need to do to get it to a, a better stage i think we'll keep things small but i am i'm i'm optimistic um i'm a two entertainment field household so we don't really have an income until one of us works um and so i hope things are gonna happen but I don't know. Yeah, and I, I, I sort of feel the same. I, I, you know, I think one of the things for Post at the moment is there is still work coming through and a lot of us are still busy for the coming weeks. That work's going to run out, but there is work around at the moment and people are figuring out creative ways to finish it. But uh, the other thing that I sort of foresee is that there will be smaller projects. And I think you know, there's directors who I've worked with over the years who are talking about documentary work or archive work, or right? Things that they can just actively work on that will, uh, you know, will result in work for all of us uh, on a small scale. Um, and I think there'll be some interesting creative stuff made in that way. So that's kind of, it's exciting on one level. Uh, it, it's exciting just to see what people will come up with in those limitations. and. Uh, so I think there is, optimi like optimistically, there is definitely work that's going to happen um, in this time and it will just be smaller and more unusual, I think, than what we're used to and it will be, you know, inspired by these lockdown conditions. So that will be very interesting to see what comes out of that. And then I think, I mean, realistically, I'm hearing the same, any of the work that I was sort of looking to go on to in the next few months, bigger production wise, is all sort of saying August, September. And I suppose ultimately what's going to happen for the industry is there's going to be a moment where 
a lot of stuff goes into production. Uh, hopefully that's sooner rather than later, but it does feel like there is going to be at the far end of this, there's going to be a lot of work, you know, so if we can all figure out a way to sort of survive this sort of lull, there's definitely going to be work on the far side of it. And I think that's a, a real positive. I think hearing that movie theaters are trying to figure out ways to reopen. I know that some of the Scandinavian countries, they're going to reopen with limited capacity so maybe one person per three seats or whatever it's just it's nice to hear that those things will continue because i think once we can come out of our houses it would be nice to be able to go to a movie theater again see some work support the industry and 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 see that thing that we all love seeing which is something on the big screen so you know i think hopefully we're moving in the right direction and i i i do i really hope that the, the, the powers that be will be cautious about it because I think the worst thing that could happen would be that suddenly it's just open season and then you do risk a second wave and the most important thing is that people stay safe and well so that we can go back to work when we're you know when when everything allows us to I think yeah it's interesting you know I was thinking as you listen to everybody talk about it that like the first set of jobs where people could go back to work presumably are sort of office type jobs where people don't necessarily have to interact so much face to face. But then also those are the people who don't need to go back to the office as much because they're all getting work done from home like this. Yeah. <laughs> so for yay sure. for us. Any other uh, thoughts, closing remarks, uh, advice? Stay safe. Yeah, I guess stay home. Keep experimenting with different Zoom backgrounds, you know? <laughs> <laughs> I just keep trying different corners. I don't know. Like the kitchen is right there, so I'm like, you know, that's a whole different game. So, Kabir, what's your favorite Zoom background so far? Uh, I'm digging this one. They just came over here earlier. Uh, you know, it was like previously facing out the window, which is nice. You can see some trees, but it was also kind of blown out from behind. So it was depending on the time of day. Um, I don't know, man. I'm just trying to stay creative, and this is all I have. <laughs> Do you think do you think that it, do you think that people will fly less like for in our industry do you think for meetings and stuff this will become a bit more normal and people will fly less which potentially is good for the environment or you know just maybe a better way for us to do business on some level if we can I hope California picks that up and yeah we <laughs> stay home for a change because a lot of us like I have a, my one child is in a French lise that's in every city so that if we get a work commitment, we can move him and not mess up his school. Oh, cool. It, you have to think in that way, like, okay, in two years or three years or in five years, am I doing a project that I really, my heart wants to do, but I don't want to screw up my kids. Right. So, sure. you know, that choice. I, I mean, I think it's going gonna, it's gonna to be so weird to see, um, you know, there's so many businesses that actually are functioning this way, and it's going to be hard for them to justify, <laughs> you know, I just imagine that the employees being like, are you sure you need me to come to work? Because we've been working this way for the last eight months now. Right, and, and everything's like, why, fine. Why, right. Yeah, and why, why bother, you know, I mean, maybe me every once in a while, but why bother, why bother putting yourself through commuting and, and polluting the environment, polluting your, your body with just the time and, you know, the extra couple hours a day driving, especially in Los Angeles. It's just like, I, I do hope there's a shift around that after this. I mean, sometimes I wish I could work from home as well in my line of work, but I can't, but it's like still, I would just hope that there is a shift with like the necessity of needing to drive to a location every day to fulfill some sort of work need. I definitely think there'll be less travel and um, if anything, runaway production for those that work in the major U.S. cities like L.A. and New York, um, you know, maybe there will be less temptation to work on location, at least for the time being. But um, to go back to the question about you know, thoughts moving forward, um, and, and Kirsten, you touched on this at the beginning, I think this is you know, I mean, hopefully those of us that um, can just eke out an existence with our savings for the time being, make the most of this time that we have off right now to better ourselves, better our health, um, think about the health of the planet, think about um, common decency among 
people in general. And hopefully we can emerge from this whole experience stronger and more enlightened. Um, that's really the only thing we can do right now. I um, don't know how long this is going to last, but, you know, I, I am very optimistic that we will get beyond this. The question is when. And I, and I hope to speak on that, John, I hope that that takeaway that we get from this time right now, we can bring back to work with us. Yeah. and sort of create uh because i feel like what we're going to be forced to do is to work with each other a lot more on supporting each other's departments when we're back to set and i really i really hope like what everyone's sort of kind of going through right now and the takeaway from that can be applied to work when we do go back and i you know everyone keeps on saying the term like when things are back to normal and i I don't want things to go back to the way they were. Mm -hmm. I want to move forward <laughs> and I want things to be better for everyone. So I think just like, as you said, I hope that, you know, we can take that away and support each other as a community better on set, you know, in our workplace. Better ourselves during this time and, and better the whole planet as a result. Of yeah, well, <laughs> exactly. Well said and thank you everybody for joining us. Um, and please stay safe. And to our viewers, we're going to be doing this again tomorrow. We're going to have another panel and we'll be talking about issues like that. So please join us. And in the meantime, everybody, please stay safe.